All right, welcome to the Mercy Cast, where we're learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. I'm your host, Raleigh Sadler. I want to tell you a story about my friend Guy. In 2009, he reached the pinnacle of his career as a youth pastor. He was at a mega church, and you know what? From the outside looking in, he had everything. But when he put his head on the pillow, he had to recognize that something was missing. He was wondering if this was all there was. Today, I'm joined by Guy Wasco. He's a pastor, a chaplain, and an entrepreneur. Guy, welcome to the Mercy Cats. Hey, Raleigh. It's great to be here, man. Good to see you. So talk me through this. You're sitting there, and like many of us, you're kind of in the dream job in a sense, but when you actually put your head down to dream, you're not dreaming about it. There's something missing. How did you process that while that was happening? I think whether people who are listening are pastors, whatever their vocation is, I think we can, most of us can relate to this idea of still feeling unfulfilled, of uh, giving your all and not feeling like it's making a difference or you're in the right spot. And for me, in my early 30s, I found myself at a flagship mega church that was a part of the denomination that I was a part of at the time. And for all intents and purposes, man, like really was at the at the peak, the pinnacle. I had arrived, you know, so right, like, right, right. like everything should be glorious and, and good and you should be happy and content. And, you know, you've got the budget and the staff and the pedigree and you're you know traveling around the country and all this sort of stuff. And And it's true for me, I would consistently have this nagging sense of discontent, this nagging sense of, is there more? Am I doing enough? Is this the right fit for me? And there was also like, not just like existential questions, but there was legitimate, like, I don't know how to say this maybe, but let's just simply say like purpose issues, like, and also context and cultural fit issues for me, just questions that I had of like, is this the actual right place for me? So there were, there were a variety of frustrations for me. I'd hit a wall. I knew I couldn't keep doing this anymore. The sad thing is we had just moved our family to this new city. We loved it there. It was going really well. We had made great friends, early, early wins with people that's disproportionate to like the time that we had spent in this city. Yeah, you so, had what you wanted. Yeah. And then you're like, is this all that there is? And that was also part of the frustration, wasn't it? You know, like, because you, you're telling yourself, it's like trying, it's like when you can't fall asleep at night and you, tell, you just keep telling yourself to keep falling asleep and you just can't, it doesn't work. You're counting sheep and yeah. you're like, this isn't working. It doesn't work. No. And so I knew I was stuck. And I knew I had to find a way out. Well, it's interesting because so many of us experience this idea of vocational dissonance that we're kind of out of alignment with what we really were meant to do or what we want to do. And sometimes we either tell ourselves or we're told by others that we should just be content. Mm -hmm. And so could you kind of help us understand what's the difference between being discontent and then experiencing vocational dissonance? Right. Yeah, I think um, I think one of the things that is really important for us to think about is our own ambition. And I can be I can be discontent if I have ambition that's misplaced. I think another reason why the the, the sort of the difference between just like not liking your job and discontent or or vocational dissonance is misplaced expectations. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? Like just like we have expectations that our job is going to fulfill us or there are certain sort of outcomes that we have to have or we deserve better when we actually uh, haven't put in the time or the work we haven't sort of earned the opportunity to sort of be at certain tables and yet we still expect to be at those tables so there's i think there's a difference between ambition expectation and then there's also just like actual bad fits like right you're in you're actually either in the wrong role or you're in, at the wrong company or the wrong church. And that's okay. It doesn't make that company, that, mis- that ministry, or that church bad. It just means who you are and how you're hardwired doesn't match the actual context or employer or you know, the job that you actually have. And sometimes we look at that job and we almost want them to change because they're not like us, but maybe we're the part that's out of alignment. Sure, absolutely. And, and yeah, it's not always the case. Sometimes change can be good, right. but I've seen some people in their occupations who are like, well, this person has a problem and that person has a problem and that person. Right. And I'm like, that's awesome. But could it be like, are you the only person or are you the prophetic type who says there are some changes right. that I want to speak truth into 
Sure. It could be either, but I think having the humility to kind of look at yourself and be like, am I on board here or is this not a good fit? Well, it's for really me? natural for all of us to want to find somebody to blame the problem. And oftentimes without reflection and community and prayer, we can make other people the enemy. We can make that, you know, those people out there and we forget our own role, our own complacency, our own competition and comparison. We can forget that it's actually part of our role that we have to play in it. Well, and Guy, as you're describing this dissonance that you're experiencing at this church, when you're kind of at the top, you're at the top of your game, you're feeling it, you're loving it, but you're not loving it. Yeah. It sounds to me like you felt like you were almost missing your purpose. Yeah, there was confusion. There was vocational confusion. Now, what's important to know about my story is if we go all the way back to age 12, I had a very a defined moment where I felt like I heard the voice of God, kind of one of those things, you know, like a, a divine nudge that I was supposed to give my life to vocational ministry. And so I did. I submitted to that. It was, it, it's not worth going into on, on today's conversation, but essentially that happened. And so the whole trajectory of my life from age 12 until even today, but especially in my early 30s, the best way I knew how to fulfill that calling was to be a vocational pastor inside the local church. So, so this was, was like an overarching purpose for you. Yeah. So I wasn't missing that problem. No. It wasn't a sense of like confusion, like, oh my gosh, should I? You it doesn't know, sound like you're missing a, that at all. Should I, should I become a consultant? Should I go into finance? There, there was none, none of that kind of. But there was something closer up that you're like. Mm -hmm. In the actual setting, again, and I think yeah. if I were to sit with somebody and try to help them understand or diagnose some of their the reasons why they might have vocational dissonance. One of them might be that, again, we talked about ambition, expectation, but actually it might just be you're in the wrong role or you lack clarity about the specific purpose, life purpose. You're gaining clarity in a more specific sense. And so I think that's part of the journey that I was sent on, Raleigh. And so to try to get unstuck in God's providence, I met this guy named Dan Webster. Dan was leading this seminar that I stumbled into at a youth conference that I was speaking at. And I had an afternoon off. So I, I find myself in the back of the room and Dan starts his seminar. And he said, every person is a journey and every journey needs a map and every map needs a guide. And so essentially he's saying every person has a calling, they have a purpose, right? And it's a journey. Like you're going from point A to point B, you need a map and that map probably has a guide, at least one guide. And I just felt like it's one of those moments, Raleigh, where I was just like, this is for me. Oh my gosh. I, I wonder if Dan's available to be my guy. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Turns out he was, and that's part of what he does. And he's really good at it. And so he is trained and certified and has decades of, of experience sitting with people like me, like you, like your listeners, trying to figure out how to help people get from where they are feeling stuck to like actually having a plan. And it's called a life plan. So I took two days flew to Holland, Michigan, where the streets are heated and the tulips are bright and wonderful, and spent two days with Dan at his house. And we walked through this thing called a life plan, and it changed my life. So describe to me what a life plan is. Okay. Yeah, a life plan is a strategic plan for individuals to help them get unstuck and live off the pages of their own story. It's a process that's rooted in decades worth of research by this guy named Tom Patterson, who passed away at 92 about two years ago. And through his consulting and work, he came up with these systems that work for business. And he thought maybe they could work for an individual. And so what we do in life planning is we take a whole person's life story, their highs and lows. We look back over the trajectory of their life, where their life changed, the turning points. And then we begin to build a strategy and plans, mine for meaning, and then build a strategy. So there's a mission statement and core values and thinking wavelength, and comfort zones and drivers and all of these different elements of what makes us human. And uh, what makes us come alive and try to mine for those clues, like I said, and then build a plan around it. What are the strategic next steps that we need to have in place so that we actually can live a fulfilled life? It doesn't mean it's not like a it's not going to insulate you from any other kind of like challenges. It's not going to it doesn't mean that like when somebody does a life plan, they're going to have a perfect life and there's not going to be any any more confusion or stuckness or anything like that. Yeah, it sounds like it gives you direction. Yeah, You know, some things about yourself. Yeah, that you believe to be true. The life plan is modifiable, meaning it's a living document because it grows as you grow. So anyway, I did that, Raleigh, and it, it changed my life. It was healing and it was empowering. It gave me the courage to be able to say, this is who I am. It diagnosed the reasons why I felt stuck and frustrated 
at the current job, even though like we already established yeah. it was a dream sort of scenario. Sure. And then, and then it also gave me the courage or empowered me to be able to take, take steps of faith for the next thing, which we left Pittsburgh and this mega church. We sold almost everything we had. We started fundraising in the middle of a recession and moved to New York city to plant a church where I knew like four people in the entire city. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense, but that's what we did. Well, and it's interesting how you talk about this idea of knowing who you are, or at least knowing what you can know about yourself right. and inviting someone to kind of help you in that journey. When you do that, I feel like you come into contact with what really matters to you, your core beliefs and values. Yes. And when you know those, sometimes it could be that you're in a particular relationship or friendship or occupation and you're feeling this dissonance. You don't know why. And so you start to maybe, maybe you're not kind to yourself. Maybe you're a little hard on yourself. Well, what's wrong with me? Right. Why can't I just get it? Right. Why can't I just be okay with this? Yeah. But when you look and know, when you actually know who you are, then you're able to be like, oh, that's it. Yeah. I'm not a fit. I, I'll never forget. I have a mentor who did a lot of this with me over years and he's, he's amazing. And guy named Louis Clark. He lives in Chicago. And I'll never forget him saying something to me. And it, it made me so angry. Yeah. <laughs> because he looked at me and he said, because I was trying to do it, man. I was like, I was a college minister and I tried so hard to fit the system for so many years. Right. And I was like, I'm going to do this. And I'll never forget him saying, you're never going to fit the system. Mm -hmm. Because there are people that fit systems and there are other people who have more of an apostolic entrepreneurial gift. And not that there's any shame on that, on people who can fit the systems, but he's like, you're going to create your own and you need to start something. And I think I spent 10 years resenting him. Mm. For that. Yeah. But then like you, I had a job that they were just, they cut it the funding to this collegiate ministry that I was a part of in West Virginia. And everyone that I worked with was looking for new jobs. I had felt called to address human trafficking and vulnerability. And I had to sell everything and I moved to New York. Uh -huh. So yep. when you say that, I really connect. But it's so interesting. You talk about this life plan. You're not coming in there with this magical juju. You're saying, we want to help you know you. That's right. So that you can know what you're experiencing so that you can know what to do. That's right. So I, I had my life plan done in 2008 and moved to New York City in 2009. In 2013, I, I got to do a renewal life plan process and then became certified as a life plan facilitator. And so one of the things that you learn along the way is I know the process as a facilitator, but I don't know your story. You are the expert on your story. So, and oftentimes what we need is this, is this idea of a guide, somebody to walk alongside of us, who stands outside of us, who can look in, who has permission to ask the hard questions and probe and bracket, or reflect back the things that we think we're hearing, mirror those sort of conversations so that you can, as a, as a client, as the one going through the process, you can have this trusted but outside voice that can help you see what you can't see. Because again, I don't know the answers. I don't show up to a life plan with a client with preconceived ideas. Even if I know the person really well, you have to trust the process. And it's in that process, really, that we realize, like, when you're fired, you, I remember Mike Iaconelli, this old youth pastor. Yeah. Um, youth specialties. He said, you never know the will of God more than the day you get fired from a job. Because it's very clear. That, now, Iaconelli wasn't saying that it's God's fault that you got fired, but you know God's will is, I'm not supposed to work there anymore. <laughs> so we're not talking about that. We're talking about, we're not talking about getting fired. We're not talking about resigning. We're talking about when you're in a job and you feel, you feel stuck. And one of the things that the life plan helped me understand is my role on the team where I was wasn't a good role. We have this tool called the thinking wavelength. And we don't have time to go into it all of it right now, but it's basically a 10 point scale. And if you think about one on the scale being concrete and 10 being on the scale as an abstract thinker and processor, one to five is sort of like one to four, sort of like the people who like doing the same things. They show up to the same job. They drive the same you know, way or take the same route to work every day. It's, it's systematized. It's dialed in. They're operations people. They're managers. They're uh, people that work on an assembly line. Right. And they're critical to life. yeah absolutely the, and and then on the on the 10 point scale like seven eight nine ten these are conceivers or conceptualizers these are philosophers these are thinkers these are people that live in their head they create things they're visionaries they're people that have new ideas and the people in the middle four five six seven sort of in the middle are people that understand both they get sort of the abstract and the concrete they understand that you need people to get the job done and also 
there's a, a need for people to conceptualize new things, to invent new ways of doing things or new products, right? So what I realized is I'm more of a seven, eight on this thinking wavelength. And I was in a job that was more four or five. Now that's a big spread. And in our research and other vocational research shows, if you, if you have more than a two point spread, you have 18 months before you're either fired, you quit or you burn out. And it's, if I look back over my story, that's exactly right. Cause we just can't maintain it for very long. The dissonance is so intense that our body keeps score. Our minds start getting yeah. frazzled. We start burning bridges. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's just bad. And so I came back from the life and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is part of the reason why I'm frustrated. The church isn't bad. The staff, the, my supervisor, our teams, none of it, the ministry, it wasn't bad. I was just in a wrong role. Well, and it's interesting because I can think over my own life and be like, wow, there have been times where I thought I was the problem because, and I'm not saying I didn't make mistakes. Yeah, sure. But, you know, it's one of those things where just to give yourself a little bit of grace and say, and sometimes it, it helps when other people are processing it with you and they're like, this doesn't sound like it's a fit for you. Yeah. I think there's a part of our humanity where we want to fit, we want to belong. You know, you talk about three things that are core to humans. It's yeah. identity, belonging, and purpose. Right. And we're talking about all three of them without talking about them. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're right. They and, don't matter. Yeah, and it's just like, you want those things, but I love how you talk about the spread because I've definitely been in those situations where it was a legit 40-point spread. Sure. And I'm like, <laughs> well, Raleigh, get it together. And Raleigh, work more. And Raleigh, do this. Try harder. Try harder. Yeah. And I'm not making it better for me or anyone no, around no. me. I'm like, I'm not a good fit for me in that moment yeah. because I'm not a good fit for the organization. Right. And no one wins. I don't win. They don't win. Right. And so it's like finding people that kind of fit and then finding where you fit. And if that means that you're supposed to start something, yep. you start something. And it's scary, but it's what you, it's what you have to do. Yeah. And some people, like when I was starting Let My People Go, and I knew you during these days. That's right. Because I, I met you shortly after I moved here. I'll never forget somebody. He, he gave me non-consensual advice. And I am not a fan of non-consensual advice. I don't. <laughs> if you are. I don't like it. It's like, if, yeah, if, if I ask for it, sure, I'm going to be very receptive. And, um, and there are ways in, through conversation and trust that I'm probably going to ask. Uh -huh. But he gave me non-consensual advice. And he said, Raleigh, here's the deal. You need to realize that starting a nonprofit is hard. Mm. You probably shouldn't start letting my people go. Mm -hmm. What you should do is work with someone else. Who's already doing it. Who's already doing it. I think it's great advice, actually. Uh -huh. It was very, I didn't ask for it, but it was very <laughs> great advice. But what I told him was, I think that's good. But what happens when no one is doing that thing that you feel passionate about? Sure. And so that for me, someone else had given me that advice that I think I asked for. Uh -huh. And they had said, if you can't find where you fit and you've done everything you could. And I, I had called everybody. Right. And at that point, no one was hiring me. A couple yeah. years into starting Let My People Go, then I was getting the calls. Sure. But before then, I had no experience in the anti-trafficking space. So I wouldn't hire me. Yeah. But I, I was just passionate about it. Right. But yeah, you fast forward through all of that. I realized that there wasn't a place where I could be a good fit mm -hmm. because of my passion. So starting something was the thing. Right. Next thing. And what that guy said was true. It yeah. was hard. It is hard. I think about another reason, like, as I'm listening to your story, like I'm thinking about one of the other reasons why people might be feeling vocational dissonance and like you're talking about not fitting somewhere. And so another thing that we learn about and that the life planning process helps with is something that we call core values. It's not a new idea, of course. And the life plan process isn't the only one doing it. I remember reading a book in seminary when I was in, in graduate school, going through my master's in organizational leadership, where we read a book by Aubrey Malfers about core values. And it's just like, this is so valuable. Every single person should know what their core values are. But if you don't know what they are and you're working at a company in a role or at a ministry where the values are completely different from yours, or they're asking you to bend your values to be disintegrous to your own values, then obviously you're going to be frustrated. You're going to be there. That's called tension. It's like sandpaper rubbing up against each other. It creates friction and it doesn't feel good. And you can't, you can't last in that for very long. Well, I think I read Malfers on strategic planning when I was in seminary. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that core values piece was so critical because I don't think anyone had talked to me about that. I don't think I'd even known anything. And so Malfers can be, 
he is highly readable, but he can also be dense. He puts a lot of stuff in there, but that's what I remember. I remember the core values that yeah. as I'm developing it's a, funny. a strategic plan, almost a life plan in right. that sense. Right. So the values thing is really important. And I think it's something that's worth exploring for people yeah. if, they, if they haven't done that hard work already. And it, again, it's just, it takes time to figure out who we are. That's that identity piece. Like every human being is asking whether they're a faith, person of faith or not. They're asking, who am I? Who are my people and why am I here? So the who am I core values, that has to do with core values fit into that identity piece. Like, who am I? As a family, we, one of our core values is, we, and we, we verbalize it this way with my kids. We say, I say, Wascos are truth tellers. And the core value is we tell the truth. Yeah. And we express it as almost every day, not every day, but we express You sit at the table and you're like, everyone. Everyone, let's recite the core values now. Wascos are truth tellers. <laughs> so, it's not like I see a picture of like a scene from Harry Potter or something. <laughs> That's not quite how it goes. But obviously with three kids, there's opportunities for sure. us to, and even myself, to be able to like, when I mess up, I need to come to my kids or my wife and say, listen, I screwed up. I need to confess. I need to uh, share this. We're, we tell the truth in our family and I want to honor this core value. And so that's just an example from our own family. But if you haven't done the hard work on your own to figure out what your core values are and you're feeling dissonance, you're feeling stuck, you're feeling dissatisfied in your job, it might be because you're having to do your work that's against your core values. And that could be one of the reasons why somebody's feeling frustrated. Well, I remember being in a job and talking to people during the job. And people saying, you're not you. Mm, yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, that's right. And it's very easy to turn in on ourselves because mm -hmm. we all have these tendencies to where it's easy to not be kind to ourselves and it's easy not to see the whole picture. And sometimes we are the problem, but sometimes we're the problem because we're not a fit. Sometimes we're not the problem, and but the problem is there because we're not a fit. Yeah. And I think this idea of you having experienced a life plan and now you do life plans for people. And I'm going to put your information in the show notes sure. so that people, if they listen to this and they connect with it and they're like, I like guy, yeah. Wascos are truth tellers. <laughs> I want a truth teller to help me think yeah. through a life plan. Need a good guide. Yeah, I want a guide to help me develop yeah. a map to help me get there. We will definitely do that because that's one thing that I'm very passionate about. So I want to connect people to you and I want to connect you to people. Sure. Yeah. And so, yeah, and so I'm excited I'm hoping someone's hearing this and thinking, yeah, man, I felt like I'm walking aimlessly through the museum of life. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I'm looking at past memories. I'm looking at things in front of me and I'm saying Potential future opportunities. Which way do I go? What do I do? Who am I? Yeah. And then to have someone who's like, not only can I help you get there, I can't guarantee you I'm going to make you a millionaire. Right. Nope. No guarantees. But what I can help you with is seeing yourself and seeing the situations you're in and trusting who you know yourself to be so that you can trust yourself to make the right decision to at least get on the on-ramp to where you want to be. I think about it in this kind of metaphor. It's kind of like the banks of the uh, banks of a river. I think core values can do this, but each of the different tools in, in the life plan help to create the banks of the river. And the force, the energy, the water, the river itself is your life and all the opportunities and potential that it exists. And what so what we're what we're basically doing is creating definition or if you want to use train tracks on a train I don't, it doesn't really matter what metaphor you use but that's essentially what's happening sure. with a life plan is it's creating a guide some protection but also some knowledge and some opportunity so that you can say yes to the things that matter and no to all the other things that are good but not for you well my friend louis clark who wrote a book called imitating jesus where he talks about his unique approach to discipleship it was so formative for me because he called it a suffering timeline. He's like, well, if God shapes us through what we experience, yes. which now you're picking up on, well, learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. I, I kind of camp out here because it's been so powerful for me. But he says, if God shapes us through what we experience, then maybe our timeline of life can not only show us who we are, but it can show us where we want to go. Mm -hmm. And so he addresses these ideas of pain points and kind of where you want to heal, where you want to grow. And you do the same as you're working through a life plan with someone. Yeah. So could you give me a story? And you don't have to give absolute specifics, but 
of how you've worked with someone or people as they've processed their own pain points and found that direction that they wanted to head in? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's, I think you're exactly right, Raleigh. It's not just the way of Jesus that we see, like the passion of the Christ is literally the suffering of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's his journey toward self emptying. Mm -hmm. Philippians says that he didn't count equality with God something to be held on to, but gave up everything to become a man, to humble himself as a man. And so this is, I think, part of the journey to finding ourselves is to also, as followers of Jesus, is to be people who are, are also willing to not just embrace the highs, but also to be present, see how Jesus is present with us in the lows. Tom Patterson, the founder of the, the Patterson Center and the life plan process, used to always say, the gift is in the pain. And wow. so the gift is in the pain. I want to say that again for those in the back. Yeah, that's, that's exactly <laughs> right. And it's so hard. At, I met him at 89. And at that point, he had already been widowed twice, buried all of his children. So we outlived every single person in his nuclear family. And he could still sit there in his wheelchair with oxygen on and, and with tears in his eyes, talk about how much he loved Jesus and how Jesus was present in his life and how he found Jesus even in loss, even in pain. So I think there's a sense of like, well, how do we, how do we go with God? How do we journey with God and see God journeying with us in our, in all parts of our life, in the highs and the lows. And so I think about different people that I've sat with where they've made financial mistakes, where they've made some some major relational failures, where they were rude or abusive toward family member or a coworker or even an employee. And they had to process that, had to walk that back, had to be humble, had to look, look themselves in the eye in the mirror and look the other people in the, in, you know, in the eye and, and say, I'm sorry and receive Christ's forgiveness. The, the thing that stands out to me the most, actually, Raleigh, it's, it's actually answering your question in the, in the reverse. I've had one client out of the dozens of clients I've worked with. I've had one client who refused to, to go into the process with a humility to see their story played out. And instead, they arrived as the client to the life planning process, having paid thousands of dollars in two days of their life to be a part of this experience and to invest in all of this. And they walked away at the end with the same conclusion they had at the beginning because they weren't submitted. They weren't surrendered. So we could talk about failures. We could talk about struggle, pain, suffering. But the truth of the matter is, I think we have to be surrendered not just to the person of Jesus, because this guy refused to see his story. He, it's written clearly on the board. I did everything right with the process. I'm not trying to like boast or anything. I'm just saying like we ran the plays, right? Yeah. And the plays spit out, you know, a, a conclusion. And that conclusion was clear and I could see it. Well, and it's interesting because you'll see a lot of this with therapy and counseling. It's this idea of having to face certain things. And, you know, some of us have been in relationships where you have people saying, well, this is who you are, and it might not be who you are. Maybe you are being manipulated. But I think there are times in life where your life just shows you, maybe I shouldn't have said this this way, or where is that coming from? Or you have to face your own wounds, your own pain that often can drive you. And this idea of accepting something, you don't have to like it, but if you deny it, then you're, you're going to put it off on other people or you're going to secretly beat yourself up and not know that you're really beating yourself up That's right. because you're unwilling to see it. It's like there's a monster in the closet and rather than me doing anything to address the monster, I put a sheet over my head. Right. Sheet's not going to protect you from a monster. I don't, I know, I mean, chupacabra don't care. Right. But, you know, if I pull the sheet off, I go into the closet and I turn on the light. You know what I did? I just faced down that thing that I feared the most. I faced that down. And so it sounds as if you're, you're doing that with your clients. And also what you were saying reminded me of a quote from Gary Haugen, the founder of IJM, International Justice Mission. He said, when I work with vulnerable populations and I work with someone who's been trafficked, they never ask, where is God? Mm -hmm. He's like, the people who are actually suffering are not asking God, where are you? You know what they're asking? God, where are your people? Because they know where God is. And we know where God is. God in the person of Jesus Christ suffered and died. Like he lived, he died, and he rose for us. Right. And 
when we realize that in our suffering, we know where God is. He's there. Yeah. We, he's acquainted with grief. We are connected to him through suffering. But when we are avoiding, when we are avoiding addressing our own issues, when we are avoiding seeing ourselves in our own pain, when we're avoiding accepting that thing that we don't want to be there, but probably is, mm-hmm. then it's going to be hard because Christ, he lived and died for our reality. Mm-hmm. He didn't die for the illusion that we project of ourselves. Right. And so you're walking people through this plan and you're saying, I'm not saying something good or bad. I'm just saying this is what is. Yeah. yeah. And the, so part of the gift for me too in the process, Raleigh, is not just being able to do this life plan and have this one experience in 2008 that led to the breakthrough that I desperately needed. And it certainly wasn't easy to pack my family up, two kids. My wife was pregnant with our third daughter, wow. move to the city and start a church from scratch, do all the fun. It wasn't easy, but because I had that definition, the banks of the river, then I'm set up with new tools to be able to face new roadblocks, new walls, new challenges, new adversities, and have compassion for myself in the experience, times when it felt frustrating or sad, or when you had to grieve the loss of funding or a partner or a core group leader. It doesn't mean that it insulates you or protects you from all that, but it gives you definition and understanding, not just about what's going on in the world outside, but what's going on inside of you as well. And then when you're faced with new opportunities, you have a grid. Like part of what we do is called the vocational matrix. Like it's literally a couple of boxes and we filter everything that we've learned about ourselves through this matrix to be able to have discernment about whether I should go left or right in new opportunities or take the phone call when the anti-human trafficking experts finally learn my name and know that I have a credible voice in the game. You know what I mean? Or whatever the case may be. And yeah. so there's, again, other tools that we have to be able to sit with people to help them understand how to find some clarity, you know? So I'm just thinking about people who might be listening and like we've talked about reasons why they might be stuck, but I'm wondering if without having to go, like without actually being able to do a life plan on air, because that would just be a really probably boring and long, oh, yeah, yeah, and not, yeah. not the right process, yeah. you know? But I'm just thinking about just some of the ways that we can help people get unstuck and find, mm. find new pathways, find new fulfillment, find, you know, satisfaction and purpose, you know? So I'm thinking about, like, how people's hearts are hardwired. Like, you got into human trafficking because you were passionate. Yeah, and you know what? I wasn't passionate about it until I realized that every one of us is making decisions every day that create a culture that enables exploitation. So whether it's, the food you eat, who's making that, whether it's the clothes you're wearing and whether it's the music or even if you're consuming pornography, like you are with every click, you are saying, this is the world I want to live in. And you know, it's interesting. You meet people and they they want to do the heroic thing, but maybe the more heroic thing is to take a step back and look at yourself and say, wow, my private decisions actually have public ramifications. And so for me, when I realized, wow, I remember saying, God, like, I had no idea that I could be part of this system. Right. And so I repented. I was like, God, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then out of that came this passion. Yes. But, it, but it took me seeing right. what was happening. And I would say, listening to your story, that the, you got to the topic or the issue category of anti-human trafficking because your core value is first rooted in justice. Yes. And so that's part of what I would help people to process and explore is what are you passionate about? Which is a question of your heart. Yeah. You know, but there's probably other clues behind your heart, behind your passion that like for me, here's a, here's a very non-important like hobby level sort of like passion of mine. I love baseball. I love baseball. I, You're a Cubs fan, I grew right? Up on baseball, uh, yes. I'm, I was born and raised in the Chicagoland area, and you know, fourth generation Cubs fan. But not just like watching baseball and going to baseball games, but playing baseball. And one of the reasons I love playing baseball is because it's a team sport, and I I love collaboration. I love team activities. Like I I appreciate tennis, but other than doubles, it's really a singular activity. Like you 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 rise and fall on your own laurels and success or failures, right? But as a, as a team, there's something about coming together, having that culture, working together in our individual roles or, you know, positions on the field. 
anyway, my point is we've all got passions, but there's probably other clues about those passions behind us, but it's also part of the fabric of the mosaic of how we learn sort of like our purpose, like why we're here that, that helped to answer that third question. Why am I here? No. Yeah, that's incredible. So some of the other things that I think about to help people are not just passion, but also ability, like four raw skills. And I think this is really important. I think every single human being has at least a couple of raw skills, things that they're naturally really good at. But when they do that thing, I don't have a core skill of soccer. I don't know why I picked sports again as another metaphor. Or you're going to pull something. Well, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like... No, I'm definitely going to pull something. <laughs> Here's another example. Like you asked me to balance your books as a bookkeeper or an accountant, and I, I, I will misplace numbers. The spreadsheet will implode and I will walk away throwing things. I'm not good at it. It's not a core skill, but it is for other people. So what's your heart saying? What's your passions? Are, do you have a core skill? Like what's your ability? You know, another thing that I think about is like opportunity. Is there an open door? And sometimes you have to like knock a door down or a wall down to get something started. Like you started, let my people go, but there was an opportunity and probably other people were giving you influence and, and advice and affirming. And so that's the other thing. Like, what are people saying from the outside? What well, is your community saying? And that's such an interesting part because when I moved to New York to start, let my people go, I didn't, I didn't have a track at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what the next step was, but I was here probably three days and I get a call from someone saying, Hey, we're about to do this very large anti-trafficking event. And I had met this person at like a house party during the summer when I was visiting a friend who lived in Brooklyn. And the guy was like, I want you to mobilize churches. Yeah. Well, I was a college pastor. I'd never mobilized churches, but I, I could schmooze and I knew how to talk to a couple of folks. Sure. And so next thing I know, I dive into it. Yeah. And now I'm surrounded by kind of the who's who of the anti-trafficking space in New York City. Right. and world leaders. And they're all kind of speaking in. And I'm gleaning, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm reading a couple of books here and there, but I'm getting way more from the conversations. Right. And so now I'm like rising with the tide. Yeah. And when that ended, I'll never forget, right before it ended, I looked at the person who kind of brought me in and I said, I think I found my calling. Mm. And he's like, what's that? And I'm like, I love working with churches to help them care for those most vulnerable. But it came after taking that step and I can look back over my life and I, I, did, I kind of detailed this in my book, Vulnerable. I kind of talk about how my life story leads to what I'm doing. Yeah, of course. But yeah, I could look back over my life and be like, even the bad things that happened kind of pointed me. They, they were like tiny markers, if I look at them, pointing me in this direction. Yeah. And then... This is where I became passionate about people who didn't have representation or whatever it is. Or this is where I became passionate about empowerment. And I think it's so important. And I love how in your life planning, you do that. You walk with people through their life story to show them where the next chapters could lead them. Yeah. Yeah. The next adventure, the next sort of turning point, as we say, in the life process. Yeah. I think another thing that we, that we look at or need to consider if we're feeling stuck and our vocation is, where's the need? Like you said, with the anti-human trafficking thing, there's an opening here. There's a gap that needs to be filled, right? There's a need here. Yeah, there are not many people working with churches in the anti-trafficking space, at least in a holistic way. Right. So no matter what it is, like whether you're talking about starting something new or stepping into a thing that's already existing, I think one of the questions that we could ask ourselves is, where's the deficit? What do I care about? Like, what breaks my heart? Where's the need, the opportunity, you know? And I think the other thing that we have to think about is like, where's the, as followers of Jesus, like, where's the peace? This is like the Holy Spirit element, right? Like, what's, what's God saying and confirming? For me, there had been a, a, an invitation, a question about church planting for years, since 2005. I wasn't even thinking I cared, cared about church planting. And then several different conversations from out of the blue, different ways that God confirmed that the Holy Spirit was working, brought me to a place where it's like, okay, finally, we have to do this scary thing and move to the city wow. and, and plant the church. Like we couldn't get away from it because that's what the Holy Spirit, this spiritual nudge, this thing that was happening. And so we had to, had to follow through. And I just think these are some a handful of questions that might help people answer, bring some answer or clarity or definition to some of these three core questions. Who am I? Where do I belong? Who are my people? And, and why am I here? And all of those things lead together, like you've already said, help to create a mosaic of answering the question about purpose. And this is the thing, Raleigh. 
I think every single person has some has a universal calling, and we read the scriptures, we understand that. Sure, love God and love others. Absolutely, it all boils down. Mm-hmm. It's followers of Jesus. It's love God and love others. That's a universal calling. But I think every person also has a more specific or unique calling. Yeah, and and then our great adventure or joy or opportunity is to find the vocation or vocations that will allow us to live out of that call. And so I think there's a variety of ways for most people to find a different job, a different career path, or a variety of career paths over the course of a person's life that help them that are still true or obedient or aligned with their calling. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. No, that's really good. And so we're kind of talking about this idea of finding your specific calling within your universal calling and really knowing ourselves so we can know where we're going next. What's some advice that you would give our listeners who are thinking, I don't know how to get out of this. And Maybe I get a life plan. Maybe I don't. But I think what matters right now is the moment. I don't know what to do in this moment. Right. And I'm freaking out. Right. Right. I'm treading water. I'm eating. I ate three cartons of ice cream yesterday. What do I do? You know, whatever, whatever it is that the person's doing rather than kind of addressing that core need. Right. What advice would you give them? Yeah. So I think a couple of things we've already mentioned are really worth sort of pointing, you know, circling back to Raleigh. I think, first of all, we, it's really, it's really difficult to do this journey by ourselves. So the first thing I would say is if you're feeling particularly stuck in a season of your life, whether it's vocational dissonance or some other category of your life, I'd say, Find the right person or persons. Find the right guide. And I, I would also just say, related to guides, it's important, I think, to, to give yourself some room, some grace, and not have to feel the pressure of finding one person who can meet all of your needs as a guide or a mentor. I think it's actually really cool. If, you, if like, let's say you have three top categories of growth in your area, in your life, you would find a mentor for your finances. Let's say you want to get better and have a budget. Let's say you want to have a public speaking mentor or your growth area, and let's say you have, you know, I don't know, you have a health, fitness, exercise goal. Or something. But one mentor, one coach is not going to be a good fit for all three of those categories. So if you're feeling particularly stuck in one place, go find the best person you can find or afford in that category. But if you have a couple of those categories, call a friend who's really good at fitness and say, can I take you out for coffee or tea or whatever uh, for two coffee appointments? And would you help me understand what you understand about being healthy and dieting or nutrition or whatever, right? But that's just an example. So we all need somebody. We can't do this alone. This journey of discovery can't do it by ourselves. So find somebody to walk the path with you. So find a guide. I think there's also some incredible resources and tools out there, books that people can read, podcasts like this one and others that they can turn to. I think about books like Every Good Endeavor or Chasing Daylight by McManus or Don't Waste Your Life or um, it's the, the gift of being yourself by Benner. You've got the living the life you were meant to live by Tom Patterson, like the guy that wrote the book on this stuff, literally Parker Palmer's book, let your life speak, listening for the voice of vocation. These are books that I would recommend people reading, finding some resources, whether it's the, the life planning process, whether it's what my friends Dave and Will have done with unique or what Donald Miller's doing with story brand and you know that kind of stuff. There's resources and tools out there that people could find. And I would just say, find a guide, find some resources, and then do the work. Just don't buy the course and then let it sit on your shelf. You've got to do the work. And then finally, I would just say, whatever's next, take the pressure off of yourself of it having to be the thing that lasts forever. It's not doesn't have to. The next thing doesn't have to be the forever thing. There's lots of opportunity and grace and time. Mm-hmm us to make some transition yeah. moments, some transition careers to, take, to go from one thing to the next thing, then to the other thing. That's totally doable, totally possible. So give yourself some space. No matter what is looming in front of you, it's okay to give yourself some space and just take the next step. Guy, thank you so much for joining me on the Mercy Cast. Man, Raleigh, it's been my pleasure. If you are interested in more conversations like this one, buy my book, Vulnerable Rethinking Human Trafficking. If you want bonus episodes, as well as a plethora of other resources, become a paid member at lmpg.org for $10 a month. You will get access to our bonus podcast, More Mercy, where we dive deeper. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave MercyCast a five-star review. We want to hear from you, so you can email us at info at mercycast.com. Till next time. Have mercy on yourselves and each other.